We have pre-recorded this month's Facebook Live. If you have any comments or questions, please list them below and we will get those answered shortly. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Malone with Advanced Pain Care and Dr. Samuel Pegram with Advanced Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Samuel Pegram. I'm a rheumatologist and I've had the distinct pleasure of attending to patients with rheumatologic illnesses for the past, what, 34 years. And I've had uh, also the more recent pleasure of attending to those patients here at Advanced Pain Care. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Malone, the founder and president of Advanced Pain Care. I've had the pleasure of treating lupus patients and rheumatological pain patients for the last 20 years. Before that, I was an anesthesiologist. Um, today, I practice pain management, and I'm lucky enough to have Dr. Pegram on staff here at Advanced Pain Care. Dr. Malone, can you tell us about your mission at Advanced Pain Care with its multiple specialties being housed under one roof? A lot of people talk about multidisciplinary care. Pain management is very complex. It requires multiple specialists, including pain management experts, rheumatologists, orthopedic surgeons, and even neurosurgeons, as well as physical therapy and behavioral health specialists. So my goal is to get all of these specialists in one room, under one roof, to talk to individual patients who may need all of us to help solve their difficult case. Dr. Pagram, could you explain systemic lupus? The key word is systemic. It is the sine qua non of autoimmune diseases that affect multiple organ systems. You know, auto means self, immune means protection, and what autoimmune conditions are is where that protective advantage of the body becomes a little confused and has the inability to differentiate self from form. And so those protective mechanisms turn on the patient's own tissue and cause multiple organ system issues uh, from simple things such as skin rashes and joint pain to more severe entities such as central nervous system abnormalities, respiratory abnormalities, and a host of others. Dr. Pagram, what does the process of getting a lupus diagnosis typically look like for a patient? Is this normally discovered by a primary care doctor prior to them being referred to you, or is this a diagnosis only a rheumatologist can ascertain? That's an excellent question. The data shows that there's about a six-year hiatus between the time a patient first has their symptom and when they're officially diagnosed. And that's because patients with lupus present in a wide variety of, of ways. They can certainly, and most of them do initially present to the primary care physician, and the diagnosis can be adequately rendered by a primary care physician. But because of the nuances of the illness and the fact that the signs and symptoms required for a specific diagnosis can occur over time, if you really want to be specific and initiate therapy early, a rheumatology consultation is preferable. Dr. Pagram, what does the process of getting a lupus diagnosis typically look like for a patient? First thing is the person that you see, remember that uh, out of every 10 people who have lupus, nine of them are women. So if you have a female who has small joint discomfort, wrist, hands, and a symmetric distribution, right and left are basically the same. Without significant joint deformities, you ought to think about lupus. Also constitutional symptoms such as fatigue, malaise, uh, decreased energy level, and what patients often call lupus fog is another tip-off that this is certainly more likely a systemic condition. Also, because, again, the disease is multi-system, that's the systemic lupus, they may present with skin rashes, chest pain, um, they may present also with numbness, tingling. So any of those various types of symptoms should at least raise a flag that this could be a disease such as systemic lupus. Dr. Malone, is there anything a pain specialist can do to aid in pain relief for a patient experiencing lupus symptoms? Absolutely. One of the big problems in lupus is the chronic pain that they experience. And much, much of it is coming from their joints. You know, their immune system is attacking their joints above all, but also other tissues like their skin, their internal organs, their kidneys sometimes. <clears throat> but their widespread pain is the hallmark. And 
patients need um, multi-specialists to address this pain. If the disease is active, we need to look to our rheumatology colleagues uh, to provide uh, biologics and other medications to modify the immune system, um, as well as pain management for day-to-day -day, you know, improvement of, of the life and um, experience of the patient. Widespread pain is, is treated by multiple classes of medications. Uh, we start with NSAIDs, you know, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Many of these can be found over the counter. There are also prescription strengths. Um, NSAIDs, we, we may also look at corticosteroids, uh, again, in consultation with our rheumatology fellows. Um, uh, some patients warrant the use of opioids, and, and we start off with the mild to moderate strength opioids, sometimes having to progress to the stronger opioids. Uh, some patients have such severe joint damage that we are doing joint injections with steroids or other medications, and sometimes we need consultation with orthopedic surgeons to talk about possible joint surgery or even joint replacement. Dr. Pagram. What does the treatment options look like for a patient? Now, Mark's point is absolutely correct. The, the beauty of having a patient in this environment is that there's two aspects of care when we're talking about a rheumatologic patient. There's the, there's the aspect of care, which is prevention of progression of disease. But then there's also quality of life because these are painful entities. Patients, as uh, Dr. Malone mentioned, with lupus have issues with peripheral nerve pain, burning, tingling. They have joint pain, swelling, stiffness. They may have um, also pain due to inflammatory conditions in the lung or the chest wall where they have pain when they take deep breaths. These require physicians who are competent and knowledgeable about certain types of medicines that are better for certain types of pain, which is what a rheumatologist is not trained to do. We are there to ensure that the disease process does not progress, that internal organs are managed well and are uh, perseverant through, in fact, the um, totality of their illness. But having alongside you someone who is attentive to the aspects of their disease that allows them to have some quality of life is essential, and that's what we do here at Advanced Pain Care. Do patients feel like this is a death sentence? What is the mortality rate? Patients read a lot of things, and nowadays there's a plethora of information that's out there. Some of it good, some of it not so good. But the um, fortunately, the survival rate now of patients with lupus compared to 50 years ago, the survival rate uh, with appropriate therapy is basically equal to that of the general population. Early detection of disease and initiation of therapy early in the course is essential to achieve that goal. It is not, in fact, at all a death sentence. In fact, the vast majority of patients during the entire lifetime of their illness only experience achiness in their joints, uh, generalized fatigue, so-called lupus fog, where there's a slight alteration in their ability to uh, manage figures and to think quickly, and again, skin rashes. That's the vast majority. Of it. it is a small percentage of those patients who get serious internal organ abnormalities, but that's what we're always on the lookout for. We manage those now, though, very well. Is there a certain demographic that is affected more often with lupus? Yes. Um, the 8% of the total population has autoimmune diseases, and 78% of those are women. In lupus, 9 out of every 10 patients with lupus are female. And thus, that is the vast majority of the patient population. It's also a disease primarily of minorities, African-American women, um, also Latino women, uh, and also Asian-Americans. All, all ethnic groups can develop lupus, but those are the vast majority of the patients. Would you recommend physical therapy or even simple light physical therapy for patients experiencing joint pain issues that Dr. Malone has mentioned? We love to send patients to physical therapy for assessment and to get them moving, get them on an exercise program. It's been shown that um, moderate exercise is very good for lupus patients. Uh, it's good for them to, to feel better and to have better uh, functional ability. 
uh, keep those joints moving. Uh, joints tend to be stiff, especially in the morning. With some exercise, they can feel better and have a better range of motion and ultimately better prognosis. Dr. Malone, can you walk us through the spectrum of pain management options? And that's what we specialize in because, again, the biggest problem in lupus is the patient's pain and comfort and ability to live a normal life. So we start with um, NSAIDs, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, Aleve. We can go to prescription strengths, a little bit stronger medications. Um, alongside that, there are other classes of medicines, including uh, antidepressants, which are effective, have been shown to be effective in lupus patients, as well as in other patients that are similar in presentation to lupus, like fibromyalgia. Many times, fibromyalgia looks just like lupus. Um, the difference can be subtle. It comes down to uh, laboratory testing and other, you know, nuances in physical examination. Uh, sometimes it's not obvious what a patient has, and that's why it can take six years to get a solid diagnosis. So it's very difficult to diagnose these patients. Many of them have widespread pain. So we start with the different classes of medications. I mentioned the NSAIDs, the antidepressants, the anti-seizure medications uh, like Lyrica or Gabapentin. Sometimes these are very effective in the neuropathic pain. Lupus can cause nerve damage. So these nerves hurt, they become chronically inflamed and they send chronic pain signals to the brain. Ultimately, if they can't be controlled with different classes of medications, there's a device we call the spinal stimulator or the spinal cord stimulator, which is very effective in chronic nerve damage. And we see chronic nerve damage not only in lupus patients, but in other patients like post-traumatic patients, post-amputation patients, uh, failed back surgery syndrome patients, which I am one. I actually have failed back surgery syndrome. I had two back surgeries to treat a severe back injury I suffered about 10 or 11 years ago. I underwent all the steps, ended up with two back surgeries that didn't help at all. I had chronic nerve damage. And ultimately, about five years ago, I was treated with a spinal stimulator. My partner, Dr. Mashad, who's also here at Advanced Pain Care, uh, in installed a spinal stimulator in my own back. And this device, which looks a lot like a pacemaker, actually blocks pain signals from my spine to my brain. So I can live a normal life. I have no pain. And uh, this, this thing is the best thing since sliced bread. So in patients who are, have severe nerve damage from whatever cause, whether it's autoimmune disease like lupus, uh, failed back surgery, or a car wreck, or an amputation, whatever, uh, a spinal stimulator is the ultimate device to block chronic pain signals from reaching the brain. Doctors, what are your thoughts on CBDs? CBD is a buzzword. It's in the news. People are taking it. You can get it over the counter. Uh, some people swear by it. There's not any hard uh, scientific evidence that it's really going to help the lupus patient, but it may. And if it helps the individual patient and doesn't hurt them, and, and I don't think it's going to hurt you, um, more power to you. <laughs> Same thing can be said to some of the other complementary medications and treatments, including acupuncture, herbal medicine, some of these other adjuncts, uh, as long as they don't hurt you and case by case, if it does help you, then more power to you. Dr. Pegram, how do you know when a patient has lupus? Well, that's a good question because, as I mentioned, they can present in such a wide variety of ways. So you have to really be astute because, as you very eloquently mentioned, it can sometimes mimic other diseases like fibromyalgia. Yeah. So you're looking for clinical signs of inflammation, pain, swelling, stiffness, not just generalized pain, although that can be part of it. Two, as I mentioned, mainly females, and so that gives you a clue. Uh, most of the time, the disease affects younger patient population, so the childbearing years is also a clue. And then the data. You know, rheumatology is a, you know, we're predicated. Everything we do is based on laboratory data. So that allows you to meet those criteria. There are 11 criteria patients should meet a minimum of four. Those include not only 
clinical findings, but also um, laboratory data also helps us make that diagnosis. Low white count, positive anti-nuclear antibodies, low lymphocyte counts, et cetera. So it's the combination of all those things that allows us to determine that true patient. Right. How many lupus patients have that famous skin rash that looks like a mask? Yeah, that the Maillard rash is probably about 60%. Um, some patients, we've, interesting, we have patients who come in and say, I've got a butterfly rash on my thigh because they think it's just a rash that looks like a butterfly. <laughs> but it's actually on the face, crosses the bridge of the nose, does not cross the nasal labial fold, does often intensify in sun. Um, but about 60 to 70% of them have the male eye rash. So it's a skin rash that looks like a raccoon. Yeah, pretty kind of much. Like you get this red, it's usually a reddish That's right. skin rash that looks like a raccoon. And if you get that, you know you probably have lupus, right? If at least a, so it's a QEN that it certainly may be. In yeah. fact, the word lupus, which is the, quote, wolf, the thought was is that that malar rash had the, the it sort of look like the face of a wolf. It looks like a wolf. Yeah. Okay, so this is where we get the word Correct. lupus. So around 60% have this. Yes. Okay. I've seen it a few times in, in my career, and it's pretty striking. Yes. yes. You know, it's, it's like a little scary-looking red rash that looks like a raccoon or a wolf. And they're often associated with rosacea. Um, yeah. But the rosacea affects also the bottom of the chin where the lupus rash does not. Ah, okay. Yes. All right. So that's a good tip-off. If, if you or someone, your loved ones, comes in with a red rash, now, what period of time does red rash develop? Or is this like you wake up in the morning with this red rash on your face? Or? Yeah, but it can occur, interestingly, it doesn't necessarily have to be one of the initial present, uh, presenting signs. Yeah. You can develop later in the disease process, but mm -hmm. again, it may be the initial presenting sign. So when a patient walks in the room, if I see somebody you know, in the shopping mall that has that rash, the first thing I think about, does this patient have lupus? Yeah. So it, yeah. should, it should... Click yeah. off something there in your you mind. You can pick them out in the population. That's right. Like, you've got lupus. <laughs> you should come see me. Here's my card. Uh, do, do your joints hurt would be the second thing. Yeah, right? joint pain. And, and that's where I think one of the questions I always have is that we're not as a rheumatologist as astute as you guys are at determining severity of pain. Um, and so I guess one of my questions to you is that when we send a patient to the pain management guys who have a back pain, and we don't know if that's part of an inflammatory process or if that's part of a degenerative process, kind of how do you guys go through the process of determining exactly where this pain is and the severity thereof? Well, that's a great question, Sam, and that gets to really to the heart of pain management, the art and science of pain management. It's not easy, yeah. like, like you say, it's, like you mentioned, it's not easy, it's hard um, so many people have back pain or, or spinal pain or joint pain, and how many of those have lupus or some inflammatory disease versus degenerative changes? That is, is a great question. And we start with a physical examination. We try to see how much joint mobility there is. Is there any sign of swelling in the back, which is hard to see, or in smaller joints like the hands or the knees or the elbows? or the wrists. Um, so p gathering clues from the physical examination and then looking at imaging, we like to get plain films of the spine to see if there's degenerative changes that we can see on plain films. And we love to get an MRI of the spine or the painful area. Usually in the, in the pain management world, it's, it's usually low back pain. That is, seems like the most sensitive area for chronic pain. So we'll get an MRI and see what what it looks like. Sometimes you can get some clues from inflammation um, on the MRI. Uh, so definitely look at it, degenerative changes. Sometimes you can tell from the physical exam and the MRI if there are some pinched nerves involved. Degenerative joints in the spine, facet joints often are causing it, or the sacroiliac joints often are causing it. So looking at those, um, films and that physical exam, uh, the next thing might be some diagnostic blocks. Mm -hmm. And we'll go in under x-ray guidance and put some local anesthetic in the joints that we think might be causing the pain and see if we get some pain relief. Yes. 
And that's very diagnostic. You know, your, your point, uh, I'm glad you mentioned physical exam. A lot of people think that lupus is based on lab tests. And yeah. we get a lot of patients who are referred because they have positive ANAs. Yeah. And, but the doctor, unless that ANA is associated with clinical findings, it really doesn't mean much. The other thing, too, is that we have patients who are sent by other physicians because they have lupus or other autoimmune disease, and they automatically lump underneath that diagnosis other entities that may be more in your ballpark. Right. They may have degenerative disc disease. They may have spondylosis. <laughs> and they've always been told, well, your pain is due to an autoimmune process. Right. But that's where the expertise of pain management doctors are there because you can differentiate that. And most of the time, it's not due to their autoimmune disease. Oh, that's, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So just because they have autoimmune disease doesn't right. mean that's where the pain is coming from. Correct, and so that's, that's exactly right. That's a critical distinction. Yes. Because you have to know, how am I going to treat this pain? Do I go with biologic infusions, for example? or Which is not going to help that. Right. Which was right, and that's the beauty about having the, the collection of doctors here that we can, that we can rely on your expertise. Right. And then if we find there is a structural abnormality, we can rely on the expertise of the neurosurgeons. Right, right. Or even orthopedic surgeons. Yes. Because we know that uh, uh, hip damage is a big problem in the lupus population. Like, don't they get avascular? Exactly. I was going to say, it's the doctors <laughs> that often add to that because of the overuse of the glucocorticoids. Right. And so that hip pain is not necessarily just due to wear, tear, and time. It's due to, to the drug and the underlying autoimmune condition. Right. Yeah. If you have to use a lot of steroids over the course of many years be, to treat this active lupus or autoimmune disease, right. it can have joint problems. You can get joint problems, including avascular necrosis Correct. of the hip. Hip and knee. So, right. And knee. And it's hard to treat avascular necrosis, right? Yeah, medically, there's nothing we can do. It right. is strictly once it gets to that point, the orthopedic surgeons are up to bat. Right, right. So fortunately, in today's world, a total hip replacement is a good treatment yes. for this. It's, it's curative. And it's almost always successful. Yes. Right? It's so, made the biggest difference in the patient's ability to live a, 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 a actually a normal lifestyle right. with the advent of, again, hip and knee replacements. Right. Yeah. Right. So total joint replacement, we see that a lot in uh, lupus. We see that a lot in autoimmune disease. And we also see that a lot in the general public. Yes. You know, um, people wear out their hips. People are living longer. People have more active lifestyles chronic injuries. So we see a lot of uh, total hip replacements, total knee replacements. And again, thankfully, these are, uh, these are effective and pretty safe in today's world. Yeah, and with the use of the nerve simulators, it also decreases the polypharmacy. They're already right. on a number of uh, drugs that unfortunately have potential toxicities. Yeah. And so with the nerve stimulators, we can decrease the pill burden. So right. that's a big advantage. Right. Pill burden is a, is a yeah. significant issue, especially in the pain management world. People have chronic pain. Uh, they find some relief with opioids. Unfortunately, opioids have side effects and they can be dangerous. You can accidentally overdose. One effective opioid now that's a newer opioid is called buprenorphine. And this drug, fortunately, is has a great safety profile. You can't accidentally overdose on buprenorphine. So it is, it's much safer and it's effective. Uh, so we are using this more and more in people who have lupus or even fibromyalgia or widespread body pain. It, it can be effective and, and safe as well. So a lot of breakthroughs going on in the pain management world, in the rheumatology world. Um, how, many of your, how many of your lupus patients need a biologic? Probably less than, um, and we only have one, which has been listed. Yeah. Um, and I would say because it's only for moderately severe disease, probably about 20 to 30%. Most yeah. of those patients are treated with disease modifiers like methotrexate, yeah. uh, maybe azathioprine. The, the really ill ones are going to end up with more aggressive therapy like rituximab, which is also a biologic. Yeah. 
but not approved in lupus, but certainly is effective in it. But the vast majority of them, it's going to be symptomatic therapy. Again, as you mentioned, the anti-inflammatory agents, low-dose cortisone, and then uh, local joint therapy, intra-articular injections, visco supplements. We use those in lupus as well. Right, right, right. How many of your lupus patients are on either methotrexate or biologic or... I think it's when we throw methotrexate into the mix, I would say it's probably about 50, 60 percent because it's a good drug along with hydroxychloroquine to prevent progression of some of the arthritic issues. It's also for um, issues of inflammation around sacs like pericarditis, uh, pleuritis, and also some of the more irritating and damaging skin lesions, methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine work pretty well. How many of your patients have active disease? In other words, just because you had lupus doesn't mean it's active. No, that's, right? a, that's a good point. As I mentioned, we get a lot of patients with positive blood tests, yeah. and they're unfortunately told they have lupus when they really don't. In those who we confirm that they do, most of them do not have severe internal organ manifestations, which is a blessing. Um, so I would say of those patients where we really need aggressive medical management, Again, probably 20, 30 percent. Okay. The kidney, though, is the one organ that we're always worried about yeah. because that's an uh, organ system that can be, unfortunately, terribly uh, severe in patients and aggressive management early on in the case or early on in the stage of the illness is yeah. really the key. But we don't see many of those. It depends on your patient population. In some areas in my other practice, we saw a lot more here we don't. It just really depends on the demographics. Yeah, yeah. Another question, uh, Dr. Pagram. In this world of, of COVID, you know, when yeah. people come down with illnesses and they don't know what's wrong with them, their body hurts, their <laughs> joints hurt, and they may have a fever. Yeah. How do you know if this is um, a rheumatologic issue? When you have an intermittent fever, say, yeah, or is it a COVID? Or it's what? Re- really, it's really muddied the water. Yeah, uh, because you always have to think about that in the yeah. back of your mind. Could mm-hmm. this be a viral entity? And so you have to go through the steps. You hit the the, the, the you put your finger right on the button. There's nothing better than a physical exam yeah. and a good history. That helps the most. Right. Your test helped to solidify what you already think is present based on your H and P. And then, if with the appropriate data set. If you have the appropriate parameters there that says this is an autoimmune disease, you, you know you're right there. Right. But it doesn't mean that people with autoimmune diseases can't get infections as well. Right. So you still have to think about that possibility. So you can have both. You can have both. Can and have- with our immunosuppressants, yeah. that makes the likelihood of the infectious process even more. Right. Yes. So if you're on chronic steroids, you could be more at risk of getting a viral correct. disease or a bacterial right. infection. That's correct. Right. And you've got... Uh, you know, kidneys are, yes. you know, injured already. You're at risk for more injury. You know, urinary tract infections can be more dangerous. And I think that's why it's it, it's important for a rheumatologist to see someone who you think has an autoimmune disease. Yeah. Because of that fact, we have to be able to differentiate what part of their symptomatology is due to a true autoimmune condition and which is not. Yeah. And it's not just, as you mentioned, fever could imply infection, but fever is also a part of most active autoimmune conditions. So you need someone with that expertise to really differentiate those. Yeah, right. And uh, see, uh, the viral syndrome has a lot of joint pain yes. as well, so it's going to be very confusing. Correct. And, and in today's world, people are afraid to go to the emergency room. Yeah. So you may be coming down with one thing Correct. or another, and you wouldn't even know it, and you'd be afraid to go in for testing. Yes, I, I agree. That's so. right. Well, I'd like to say thank you very much to the Lupus Foundation for allowing us the opportunity to speak with you today. Obviously, thank Dr. Malone for inviting me to be a, a part of this discussion. The Lupus Foundation is great because it allows us to do two things. It allows us to take, to take care of the patient here in the office, and it also lets us to extend our treatment to others through the Lupus Foundation and all of their efforts. So we thank you very much for the opportunity. At Advanced Pain Care, we're very happy to be part of the Lupus Foundation. We're, we're happy to be invited to give our little talk here. Uh, again, lupus is a great example of the type of thing we're trying to treat here at Advanced Pain Care, where we bring all the specialists together, the rheumatologist, 
the pain management experts, because again, lupus is a painful condition. It presents with pain. People are living in pain. They're living in joint with joint disease. That's one reason we have orthopedics on staff here. Uh, we have behavioral health because again, there's a lot of neuropsychiatric problems in lupus and other autoimmune diseases. Um, so we have all the specialists in one house. We have uh, spinal experts, we have neurosurgeons, um, and we try to do it all here for lupus and other painful conditions. At advanced pain care, the pain stops here.